Hello. <laughs> I hope you all had a uh, good lunch. And to stay in the food theme, we, uh, we chose some fruit salad for you. Um, <clears throat> now, the, uh, the flyer said this, uh, this keynote was going to be in German, uh, but that was just to, to lure you in. Uh, so glad you all made it, uh, but it's going to be in English because uh, uh, my, my German is high school level and uh, uh, it wouldn't be sufficient enough. So I'd like to, to, to begin to talk uh, with you a little bit about naming. And uh, for that I have this wonderful image. Can anybody guess what this fish is called? Ah, blobfish, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Indeed, it's called a blobfish. Uh, and I think it's, it's, the, well, the, the name is pretty, uh, is pretty apt, because it clearly derives its name from, uh, from how it looks. And there are many other things that are named uh, e uh, either from how they sound or how they look. So this, for instance, is a tuk-tuk. Is a, uh, um, and uh, many birds, uh, for instance, this grutto, or uh, uh, godwit, as it's called in English, derives its name from, uh, from, how, from the sound it makes. And those class of names uh, are called onomatopoeia. So that's Greek for the sound I make. So it derives its name from, from how it announces itself to the world. And many of the, of the, the, the sounds you see in, uh, in comic books also have this, right? You have the, the knock and the pinch and the screech and the thump. Those sounds are, are, are that class of, of names. And it's interesting because if you look at how we name things in the world, there is basically there is a uh, um, interesting phenomena going on, and uh, it's called the Baba and Kiki effect, and that's a non-arbitrary mapping between sounds and shapes. So there was this researcher, I think it was in the 60s or so, and he showed these two shapes to hundreds of people from all over the world, different countries, different cultures, and they asked the basic question. Which one is Baba and which one is Kiki? And it turns out that, the, that like around 98% say that Kiki is the pointy one and Baba is the nice round shape you see on the, uh, on the right. Now, my name is Ernst, this is Flavia, and that's also for obvious reasons, of course. <laughs> And we work for ING Bank, which is uh, depicted here as this, uh, as this friendly lion. Um, and some names are just hard to get used to. You have this spork thing, uh, this mixture between a spoon and a fork. It's a portmanteau where you merge two words. Or um, you have mondegreens, and I think in, in Germany you call this a tasse which in, 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 uh, in Netherlands, in Dutch, is a bag. So, something you carry with you. Um, and in English, a tasse or a taser, eh, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a really <laughs> good, good, good thing you want to, to walk into. So, mondegreens are words that you misunderstand. And you, you often hear that in songs. So you hear a song on the radio, and you're singing along, and then after five years, it turns out you've been singing all the wrong words. <laughs> yeah, and our, in, our industry is also not always as, <laughs> as good at naming things. We have this wonderful acronym for the hypermedia of application state transfer, something like that, this, this, this REST, uh, REST thing. Uh, and it, I, I got, this is a hard one for me to remember. So why am I telling you this? Well, <clears throat> in computer science there are two hard things, right? Cache invalidation and naming things. <laughs> well, cache invalidation is a different conference and a different talk. I specifically want to talk to you about naming things today. Because naming is essentially uh, communication. And it's inter interesting because how can, in such a technical environment, uh, the hardest thing be a non-technical task? Well, that's because naming is, is inherently um, a human thing, right? So it conveys purpose and intent and usage. Uh, and while the compiler might not care how you name your variables or your classes or your resources, we as human, uh, humans highly benefit from uh, source code or, or resources that are named uh, meaningful so that we can derive purpose from, from them. So naming is hard because it's a non-technical task. It's a human effort. 
And it's, just, it's not just naming that is human. So we see this slow shift in software, in IT, where the software is becoming more and more humanized as well. So it used to be that we, uh, the users, had to adapt to the tools that we were using. Uh, but over the years, things have, have gradually shifted so that now systems and computers and software adapts to us, to the user. So we no longer have to learn how the tool works. Now the tool has to learn how we work and adapt to our environment. And you see this specifically with these uh, Amazon Dash buttons, where uh, you buy these, or I think they're free because you get a discount on your next order or something. And these buttons are placed uh, at places in your home. So you can place this Gillette one uh, next to your shaving equipment, and whenever you're out of shaving material, you push the button. And it places an order for Gillette things on your Amazon shopping uh, basket. And they have, uh, I think, around four or five on it with different brands and different materials and different packages that you use in your daily life. You buy these buttons, you place them all around your house, and well, before you know it, you're, you're pushing buttons all day. So software needs to <clears throat> uh, find users basically in their place and in their time nowadays. And that's really important. Um, and we see this on the internet with a lot of um, uh, uh, companies who are trying to, to, to get their software into the, all these platforms. We as ING, of course, do that as well. And this is called, and this is a term coined by, uh, by a design agency called Fjord. It's called brand atomization. And brand atomization is the idea that your brand or product or service that you're developing just magically appears on whatever channel the, your, your, your customers are using. So to give you an example, uh, Spotify. Right? It appears on your mobile phone. It appears in your car, uh, and it appears on your watch, if you, if, if you have a smartwatch or on your laptop, it doesn't really matter. So the brand and the product uh, adapts itself slightly to the channel that you're using it on. And they do this by letting go of very strict design guidelines, because it, it, it looks and feels a little bit different on each device that you're using. By, but by, by letting go of control, they are able to reach an extremely wide audience. So they're, they're shipping their brand in small atoms, small shippable packages. And, and you may ask yourself, why go through all, all the trouble? Um, well, for that we have to, to step back uh, a couple of years to, uh, to an economist called Joe Pine. And uh, around the 80s, he came up with, um, um, with a model <clears throat> where he uh, talked about value. So how much is something worth, or uh, to put in other terms, how much are people willing to pay for something? And he came up with four categories. And uh, the first one um, uh, is, this, is, 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 is this one that you see over here, and this is an example of coffee. And it's a coffee plant. You may buy it like this at a, at a, yeah, at a nice high-end um, uh, flower shop. But of course, in real life, you have rows and rows and rows, endless of these coffee beans. And the coffee uh, farmers make these by the gazillion. And they're worth very little. And Joe Pine said, well, <clears throat> if you move up the stack, you go from commodities to goods. And goods are packaged commodities, right? So they typically come with a name on it or, they, or, they, or, they're, or they're in some way processed. And that's worth more. So the value, what we're willing to pay for it, goes up. Uh, and he said, well, the next level is the services economy. So probably in your, in your offices and, and, and in hotels like these, you'll find coffee machines, which you can just, at the push of a button, you have coffee. But you're not actually buying the coffee, or in, in, in some sense you are. You're also paying for the maintenance of the machine and refilling of the, of the, of the beans. And if it's broken, you can call somebody and, 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 a, and a, a technician comes over and fixes the machine. So the service of having coffee is worth more to us than just uh, raw beans. And on top of this, he said experiences are what people are willing to pay the most for. 
Because experiences are personal and they are unique and they are one time only. And in the coffee example, this would be Starbucks, because you're paying a pre premium for the experience that you're getting. But the restaurant business in general is a very good example, because you don't go just to a restaurant to eat. You go there to meet friends, and you choose a restaurant because it has a nice atmosphere or it serves a particular type of food that you're maybe used to from a, from a different country. So the whole experience of going out for dinner is worth paying for. And these experiences are what can be so well done on these personal devices that we now, along, that we now carry. So all these phones and all these watches and all these things that you're having are wonderful at knowing you and of adopting the software so that it tailors to your experience. And to do that, well, we would like to propose or submit that the API is a brand atom. It is, in fact, the smallest shippable unit of your brand that you can, that you can deliver to a device or to a user to make a personal experience. Yes. Now, a lot of our current packages, brand packages, look like this. This is the ING website from a couple of weeks back ago. Um, and that's a bit hard in the sense that you have to get people over to your site, right? You have to lure them into, 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 into your conference, just as, as I did by saying the talk was in German. Well, that works only once. So you have to get them over to you, <clears throat> rather than that you can, can go out to them and meet them where you are. And while <clears throat> it is hard to ship uh, uh, your, your, your entire site as a package, it does serve as a great model for how we should design our APIs. Because if you look at this website, you get a rough idea of what we're doing. Basically, it's probably in Dutch, so maybe may a bit hard to read. But we do stuff with finance, right? We have a community, and we do things with credit cards. So you get a rough sense of what we're doing, even if the language may not be your own. Now, imagine we would have designed our site like this. Uh, would you be tempted to email us? Uh, most likely not. So the way we design our websites and the care we put in the URLs and the naming and the pictures serve as a great model for how we should design our APIs. Because if you really think about it, then you could say that URLs are a form of user interface. The URLs should be easy to understand, to discover, and they should um, convey a message of, about your business, of what people can do with your product, with your API, and when they look at your API, they should get a sense of which business you're in. Right? If they would look at the ING APIs and think we would sell coffee, then we did something wrong. Now, there's a great term in product design for this, and it's called affordance. <coughs> now, you may have heard about it. And affordance uh, suggests how an object should be used. Um, so it's a visual clue to its function given a context. And an interesting example is this teapot. Right? This teapot typically doesn't come with a manual. You instinctively know how to grab it and, 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 and pour a cup. Now, if you think of this teapot and you, and, and you plot these resources next to it, yeah, things and stuff and manager and transactions, yeah, maybe, uh, but they don't have that much affordance. So naming things, especially for people who may not be so familiar with your domain, is crucial when it comes to conveying what your API and your brand is all about. The second trend that we observe is that a lot of companies are trying to become programmable. So this whole programmable infrastructure, programmable web, Amazon is a great example of this. Uh, but also uh, ING and a lot of other banks are trying to become programmable bank operating systems. You can use our infrastructure and our, and our, and our services to build products on top, uh, um, and thereby make great products yourself and, of course, sell our stuff. Um, <clears throat> and companies do this because they... Oh, sorry. Because they are trying to grow horizontally. So they're trying to, 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 to reach more customers at the same level of production. So in other words, adding a new customer in a horizontal growth model doesn't increase your cost. You have this fixed marginal cost. And you can do that because the internet brings you practically zero distribution cost. It doesn't cost anything to ship another API call. Oh, 
okay, it does, but it's a fraction of the cost of what it would, would, would be to ship an actual car or a physical, a physical product. So the internet and APIs are a great way because, and that, this is why they're disrupting, right? Because they're, 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 they're taking a lot of the, 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 the geographical constraints out of the equation by setting the distribution cost to zero. So we can safely say that APIs are changing your business. Um, they either internal, right? You're making APIs to become more effective, more efficient, or uh, in partner or in industry, uh, uh, industry fields and even public APIs. So ask yourself. <clears throat> so the message. So what you sh should really be asking yourself is: If I'm not doing anything with this internet thing, right? These APIs. <laughs> Am I still relevant in five years? Because the internet and, 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 and the API market are fundamentally changing how we communicate to customers. So you used to have these ad, ad, ad agencies sitting in between you and your customer who would determine how your brand looked and what your customer segmentation was. And with the internet, with this zero distribution cost and, and basically you knowing your customer directly, you can market them to them instantly, very personally, on their own device, in their own place, and in their own time. And you can do that because we have these wonderful APIs. So, <clears throat> the way this works is the digital value chain. You saw this one in the opening presentation as well. Where you have a brand asset, and you place this guy, the developer, <laughs> in between, and he builds these apps, that sit in front of an API. And the way the value trickles is through this middle guy, through this developer, the API, and of course the team that builds the API. And this opens up a new segment of customers, namely the people who are developing with your APIs. So in this sense, the developers are your new customers, and they should be treated, treated as such. Because when you think about it, if you move into the API business, there are so many questions that pop up, rather than just the technical frameworks. Right? How, how are we going to pull this off? Who are we going to market, market to? What are the new revenue streams that we want to get out of these APIs? How are we going to build this ecosystem around our developers? How do we communicate to them? How do we reach them? How can they find us? So a lot of these how might we questions crop up when you start to take these APIs really seriously. So the question becomes, yeah, how might we find answers to these questions? How might we? And for that, I would like to... <laughs> how might we? Wow, that's some acronym to uh, have a hand over, I must say. Um, how might we? We'd like to suggest that we, uh, just like scientific method, go to a process which is called inquiry. Inquiry is a way where you systematically investigate those questions. And those questions are broader than just the technical realm, as Aaron suggested. API becoming the brand atoms, a lot of technical questions, but also marketing strategies, revenue streams, need to be answered. And we need something which allows us to progress or allows us to do inquiry better. And to be honest, if there is uh, one discipline which has proved itself uh, very good in handling inquiry, that would be the discipline of design. Design is a way to do structured inquiry. It promotes communication and collaboration and allows you to co-create with a group of people in a structured way. Let me give you an example of how a design process looks like. This is a model which is put forward by the British Design Council. British Design Council looked at design projects, not necessarily software, any design project, and they saw these phases, you can call, four things which happen in a design process. So you have to discover, define, develop, and deliver. And they called it the double diamond model because you can see two diamonds in them prominently. And if you look at, they are diverging and converging 
diamonds. So the discover is a divergent face. The define would be where you converge. And a nice way to remember this model is the right diamond is about doing the thing right, and the left diamond is doing the right thing. And we think that a lot of APIs currently start in the right diamond, where given the requirements, we know how to do them right. We know the technology to build APIs with and iteratively ship functionality, take care of versioning, and that kind of stuff. And we'd like to, with our talk, inspire you to bring it to the left diamond. So we want you to bring APIs to discovering what is the right thing to do. And that's a bit more hard than where APIs are currently at. And you might think that that double diamond was a nice and sequential model, right? So it sort of looks like waterfall a bit. It's hardly a waterfall or a sequential looking model. So when you go through those design phases, it feels a bit like this. This is called as a des design squiggle. So it's a bit non-linear. You might feel uncomfortable. Who are all these people around me? A lot of iterations happening so that you, so getting to know what the right thing is, is inherently hard. You can't do it in your cubicle, sitting in your office. You need to talk and approach, who is it who is going to use my API? Who are those people? Why, why, uh, why am I doing it like this? Why can't it be like that? It feels a bit like this, and it's okay. So if you don't feel uncomfortable, maybe it's, yeah, maybe you should rethink on what you're building is indeed the right thing to do. So design squiggle is a ni nice mindset to have when you are in a design project. And to help you through this non-linearity is a very rich toolbox. So we'll not go into explaining all these tools to you, but these, tool, these tools help you collaborate, help you communicate to each other, people from different disciplines, to create uh, and to make progress in your API journey. There are a lot of them. This is an extract uh, uh, which fits on a slide, I think, and looks nice. So it's a rich toolbox. So design is not only a mindset. It also gives you tool and empowers you to create good APIs. And so what, what we are here to suggest is a design methodology for developing APIs. So you might have already guessed that this is taken from the design methodology of a design project, but we tailored it to fit to APIs. Right? And we would like to have your opinion on this, because this, this is a very opinionated piece uh, which is going to follow. And uh, it comes from a lot of experience we have had at our own company. But uh, I think this uh, crowd is, is a nice and diverse crowd to give us uh, uh, your feedback on what you think of this. So uh, one thing to remember in this methodology is that you can't pull it off yourself as techies. You need other people. And the fact that we are here addressing a technical audience is because you're special. You're special because you inherently understand the technology. You understand how the internet works. So we want you to become champions, go back to your organization, and tell that API design is not just for techies, that we need other people. And this methodology will help you identify those people and collaborate with them as well. So pay attention. The methodology consists of three steps. So a little bit the uh, double diamond steps, starts with discovery, goes to domain modeling, and on to prototyping and building. Right? Let's look at the first step. Discovery. Discovery is probably the most important step uh, in building a good API. And if you look at the inquiry or the questions you're trying to solve or trying to answer in discovery are in the realm of, what problem are we solving? For whom are we solving these problems? What are the constraints? What's the ultimate impact on the world we want to have with our API? What are people willing to pay? What are our marketing and distribution channels? Very broad questions. So it's inherently a divergent phase. You go out there to find out answers to these questions. And some answers are found within your organization, others are not. You have to go in the market and find out who is willing to pay, 
who is willing to work with your API. And to aid you in the discovery process is a nice toolbox. Some of it probably uh, you're familiar with, like the business model canvas, and the others are coming from the design thinking discipline. And my favorite would be the design challenge, uh, which I'll explain a bit later. And if you look at the last two, the personas and the contextual interviews, they help you to find out who the users are and how much they know about your domain. This is a great way to name things. So Ernst mentioned the way we name things is inherently how we communicate. So if I name a resource as individual, I have to know if the person who is using my API even understands what I mean by that word. So personas and contextual interviews are a great way to find out what, what's the level of knowledge in the market about my API. How would people perceive it? Domain modeling, probably very familiar. I guess this is where we all get to shine. This is a, 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 a nice face uh, for us. But this is not a standard domain modeling execution. Because before we model the domain, we have to answer a very crucial question. With, with which perspective? How do we model our domain? Do we model it with the perspective of our backend? our infrastructure, so the uh, perspective of ourselves? Do we model it with the perspective of the application which is using our API, the perspective of the screen? Or do we model it for a podium, for a stage where people can create their own experiences on top of us? So if we don't answer this question, we'll come up with a domain model which is probably confused. So this Answering this question is inherently important before we do any kinds of domain modeling. And to aid, this, these, these are the kind of uh, questions you'll answer in this phase. What are the queries? What events take place? Bounded context. I think very familiar stuff come, uh, comes from uh, domain-driven design mostly and other software practices we are used to. Toolbox. Most of the things are comfortable here, except probably the first one, the design perspectives, which I'll explain a bit later. The third one, prototyping. Probably heard a bit, not used that much, most used in uh, UX and those kinds of disciplines. But prototyping is a great way to understand what the users, the first impressions, to gather the first impressions from the users, to see if you're missing functionality. and a great way to really think or see if we understood the problem. This is where the iteration takes place, right? So if in prototyping we discover, OK, the problem which we understood is not really a problem, should go back to the discovery phase. Right? Great way to uh, find out, gather input before you actually invest time in building your API. And prototyping has this very rich toolbox. Uh, you can go from paper prototypes to actually mock implementations. So it, we, I think, categorize it as low fidelity and high fidelity uh, prototypes. The low fidelity ones are a great uh, way to uh, capture uh, input quickly. We'll look at service blueprints uh, a bit later, because uh, that one is a, a new one uh, there. But the other ones are probably uh, quite familiar to you. So that was uh, the design methodology, which, which looks like nice and sequence and linear, but it is far from it. So let's look at a couple of things from the toolbox, because uh, I want to leave you with this comfortable feeling that uh, you understood some of the elements uh, which I'm talking about, which might be new. So the design challenge. Uh, this is one of my favorite. Uh, 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 tool, tools we use uh, to define what, what problem we are solving. And I'll start with the output of the design challenge. How might we create a convenient way of booking a trip? Nice and elegant, isn't it? Behind this design challenge 
is a 90-minute session with 10 stakeholders facilitated to the core. It took 90 minutes to come up with a simple and elegant statement like this. If you look at that statement, it is a bundle of things. It's making clear what the problem is. The problem is that people don't have a convenient way of booking a trip. It's looking for an ultimate impact, convenience. It's giving very clearly the constraints. It's talking about airline reservation, hotel booking, rental car, nothing else. We could have done more, but no, we stick to these constraints. And for whom? For business travelers. Elegant statement, which is answering very crucial points. And I think if you come up with a statement like this, this is a nice way to kickstart your API project. Because given this statement, you can have a team look for answers on the statement. So this is where you can diverge and find out who those business travelers are, how do they use booking systems, what are their current booking systems. But this is not going to come easily. This is, I think, one of the hardest tools there, which results in the easiest of uh, sentences. It's a bit uh, uh, catchy. And uh, if you want to do this right, there are, uh, uh, I think, the IDEO design kit, that's the source we mentioned here, has a great way of how you facilitate workshops like this. Whom do you need to frame sentences like this? So it's, it's a nice one to kickstart your API. And even if you have started, try to formulate a sentence like this for your API. Talked a bit about design perspectives. They come in handy when you are uh, approaching domain modeling. Right? We talked about these three. Let me explain these with an example. I'll take the example of a credit card request. Uh, just for caution, this is not the credit card's API of ING. It's a, a credit card's API. And if you, if you look at uh, uh, the perspective of the self, so this would be an API which exposes internal processes. It's an API which, which could be chatty, which has a reference uh, to system specifics or magic numbers. I think you have seen these APIs. They, they crop up a lot. These are the APIs which look a bit like this, right? A lot of requests. This is an application for a new credit card. I explicitly put the a second one, the BKR Toots stuff, which cannot even be translated because it's a Dutch credit check. So imagine translating something like that. But that's the end point of your API. And a person who is going to use your API has to have a lot of knowledge about how your internal processes work, right? This is another one. Well, the, the, the perspective of the self is a bit more egoistic, so you, uh, uh, you make an API and expose who you are. This is another one. This is where you look at the application who is using you. Probably you already know that a website is going to consume your API or an app. So you create an API from their perspective. This is a nice API as well. You, you say, OK, uh, it works perfectly for that application. It uh, goes how those screens are developed for that application. It matches the front end, gives nice validation and messages. An API, the same API could look like this. So it doesn't bother anymore about those internal steps. It follows the screen. Step one, step two, step three. The only problem becomes when you want to use this API on another screen. Let's say the mobile application came along and introduced a four-step process. This API wouldn't work very nicely with that screen. So it works with one application, but doesn't work with the others. Right? So uh, some of them are happy, some aren't. So you're not, you're not making all your developers happy. The third one, the perspective of the stage, is where the API is the least egoistic. So the API says, you do your thing. I will allow you to create your own experience on top of me. I will get out of the way. I will allow you to compose your requests the way you want. I will allow you to query me the way you want. I'll 
get out of the way so that you can create multiple experiences on me. A great example of this would be GraphQL, which exposes the model and allows the consumers to compose the queries. The example I have here is where you compose a request in different ways. So the API really doesn't care about how the request comes together. It gives you complete flexibility of composing a request. So you can imagine that the same API would be very much usable for a website or a mobile phone or a watch or whoever. Because it, all it worries about is, OK, if the request is composed, submit it. So a stage API is inherently the least egoistic, and the self API is the most egoistic. Now, I'm not here to say what's good or bad, because that depends on your design challenge and your discovery phase. If you know who the users are, you will be able to make this decision. But please make this as a conscious decision. Because when you don't make this conscious, your domain model starts to look very confused. And that, that's not a nice thing to have if, you're, if you care about your developers. A last toolbox element I'd like to talk about is the service blueprints, probably a well-known uh, term, frequently used in service design and design thinking uh, engagements. And service blueprints are prototypes like this, where, where on the top you will see a user journey or a customer journey, and from top to bottom you s validate what it takes to deliver such a journey. So you might have a fantastic experience in mind which you want to deliver as a company, but you come to a point where you say, oh, but I can't, I have to wait on that API for three months to have this happen. So this is a great way to validate if you as a company are ready to deliver the experience you have in mind before actually building it. The source I have there is practical service design. They have a great way to facilitate workshops with examples on how Blueprint should look like. I think a great tool to validate APIs. And yeah, that being said, uh, we started this talk on a provocative note that API design is not to be left to techies. And I think we'll end it with a more positive note. I think API design involves more people. Thank you very much.